Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Welcome to Late Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for a very special edition of the show. So this was supposed to be a live stream. I was going to play all the clips live and all this stuff, but I'm not really experienced with OBS, which was the free software I was going to use. Um, it can do streaming, which is great, but I was having a hard time with the clips not working. So um, yeah, that's going to have to be another show of live streaming. However, I might be doing... A live stream maybe eventually but it might be before you see this actually so I'm not sure how that's gonna work out but it's probably gonna be at least a Skype call with a buddy of mine we're gonna do some wines so that's probably gonna be next week's episode anyway 11th anniversary episode um, you know if if you had asked me 11 years ago if I would still be doing this um, I, I don't know what I would answer because, I mean, I started this thing off, well, you know, before we get started, let's, let's pop some champagne, all right? So, um, I don't have the wine key with me here. I'm supposed to use your wine key with this stuff because these little tabs are notorious for not working right. But, here we go. We're going to get some Bruno Payard popped. And, uh, so if you've been watching the show for a while, you know that... I like Bruno Payard. Um, I tend to get a free sample every year of some sort. Um, I got to meet him last year. I used this as my champagne for the 10th anniversary episode. So if you didn't watch that one, go and watch it. Um, so, and if you want to watch, so that has his full interview in it. Is you know episode uh, 450, the 10th anniversary episode. So make sure you go watch that. He's a badass. So, um, we're going to start off with some legit champagne. I, I, I thought about this. I've, I've had this bottle for a few months. Uh, it's about 50 bucks retail, pretty much anywhere you want. Um, I kind of think that, at least because I got to interview him, I got to meet him and his uh, daughter over in Provine, that maybe this should always be my anniversary champagne. I mean, this Bruno Pryor is really good. You know what? And, and here's the thing. I'm not saying that, you know, in other anniversary shows, I won't maybe bust out Krug or something like that if I if I got the money to do it. But this is 50 bucks, and 50 bucks is about standard. You can probably find some, you can find some champagne, so like 40, maybe on special for 30. But 50 bucks is, you know, that pretty much entry level champagne, and it's all going to be good. So before we get started, cheers to 11 years. And let's do 11 more, or 22 more, or whatever. And if you're new to the show, yes, I drink sparkling wine, champagne, in regular wine glasses, not flutes. You can watch one of my other episodes about that. It's good, as always. Um, this is not really a review show. It's a review show of past shows, not a review show of wine, necessarily. But... Let's just kind of go through the wine real quick. Um, it's got all the classic brioche and toastiness and that apple-y, that most like that kind of like green apple. And Bruno doesn't put a lot of dosage in his wines. He, he likes his stuff as dry as possible. So that's what I like, that's what I like about this wine. Um, you know, it's it's got that acidity, it's got that brightness, and it's just delicious. It's 50 bucks. If you see it in the store, buy it. If you don't have it, for some reason, a retail shop near you doesn't carry it, go to like wine.com or anywhere online that sells good stuff. We'll have it. About 50 bucks. Might be a little bit less, might be a little bit more, depending on where you are in the country. But excellent quality stuff. Um, I'm going to have 
another wine a little bit later. So um, in addition to this, so I, I've got a script over here. I mean, I have I've got my monitors going on. I have I'm all set up. Um, I, I don't have. A, I'll show you a picture from earlier in the day that I had taken pictures. I was getting I posted on Instagram going, hey, I'm going to do this, blah blah blah, and then I couldn't get things to work. So you'll see a picture of the setup. Throw it up here in a second, or I've already done it. So anyway. Uh, let's see here. I think I've already talked about all that. So, you know, looking back at the first episode, I, I was reminded that my initial idea for Elite Wine was actually as a wine label. I kind of, I mean, I know that, but I kind of forget that that was really the, the, um, inspiration of, of buying the, buying the website name is that I was like, that'd be a cool name for a wine. And I have talked about that as a story, but this... And what this is was really uh, about two months later. I came up with the idea of a podcast and making this the diary of uh, my studies. And that was from the beginning. As a matter of fact, early, early on, it was never part of the podcast. It was never on the YouTube channel, but on the website, I had something called Psalm School. We'll get to that a little bit later. But uh, yeah, so this is episode four, five. This is episode five twenty two. Some over five hundred episodes. That's 20 plus years of television, 20 full seasons of television. If you're using 26 episodes per season, none of this BS that you 8 to 10 freaking Game of Thrones is 10 episodes a season. That No, that, that's half season, maybe. It should be around 20 to 26 episodes a full season. Um, I, you know, this show has afforded me uh, a ton of stuff personally and professionally. Uh, I never imagined where I'd be with the show when I started out. Uh, just put this way, I have, I've gotten so much access because of the show um, to wineries, to people in the industry, conferences, you, know, you name it. If it's part of the industry, this podcast or internet show, whatever you want to call it, I still like to call it a podcast, I'll cover that in a second, um, has given me extra access than maybe being just a buyer. And for a lot of the years I was doing this, I was just like a restaurant manager. I didn't become an actual buyer until 2014. And that was at Morton's. I became a buyer and that I had even greater access because I have the double whammy. I got the one-two punch. I'm a buyer for a major, you know, uh, fine dining chain. Oh, and I'm a member of the press. Yeah, uh, you know, so I definitely leverage that. Uh, where I'm at now, I still have that kind of cachet, not quite the same, um, only just because I'm in retail versus fine dining, but the company I do work for, I mean, we still we buy a lot of wine as a company. Um, so tonight, uh, I'm picking a few, I say a few, um, it's a total of 24, um, 24 clips that we're gonna be watching. When I did, when I was playing this on the live stream, I was planning for it to be about an hour. It was probably realistically about an hour and a half. So this is going to be unusual in that it's going to be a bunch of clips here also, not my usual just one take and go. Um, so it's just I'm not really doing a, a true review of wines, even though I've just already given you my opinion about this, but I already know this is always good. Like, it's solid. Um, when I talk about the next wine, you know, that will be its own clip. But um, so you're going to see a bunch of clips. And you're going to see the clips, and I'm going to kind of talk about them as I'm watching them. So I'm going to overlay the audio. Is that overlay? Is that what they call it? Overlay the audio while you watch the clips and all that. So um, so let's see here. Uh, just and I've grouped them into a few categories. And just the problem is I have 521 episodes. So it's like having 521 kids. And it's trying to pick your favorite kid. You know, if you didn't pick, if you didn't pick Joey or Susie, they might think that you don't love them, and that's not the case. So, especially on the interview side, if for some reason I didn't pick an interview, and you're watching this, and it wasn't your interview, it's not because I didn't think we had a great time, and I think the interview was awesome. There might have been something that I kind of really wanted to highlight in those interviews. As far as the wines, sometimes it wasn't really the wine I was reviewing. It was more about the significance of that episode. All right. Um, all right. So let's go start our reviews. 
why not why not start with episode one? So this started off as a review show. Uh, I wanted to focus on ten dollar ish wines because uh, back at the time I was what I could afford. And then actually about a week or two after I started this whole thing, I quit my job. So and I was doing five days a week. So I definitely needed to keep around ten bucks. But over time, obviously, if I increase the budget, I'm spending fifty bucks on a bottle of wine. But my, it was it was for a long time twenty to forty bucks. I still try to keep it around 20 bucks, maybe a little bit less, maybe sub 15 occasionally. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and watch the first episode. So for the first, I don't know, hundred or so odd episodes, I had no intro music. I had a really just a, a boring scroll for it. Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark V. Fusco, and this, my friends, is the Leet Show, aka the internet's most elite wine program. Yeah, I just did a Gary Vaynerchuk. But, you know, he's the inspiration for all this. Um, and this, guys, this is the inspiration for Leet Wine. When uh, when I saw this wine at World Market, I don't know if I can really get this done right, but I saw it kind of at an angle. Now, those of you that are geeks like me know that 1337 spells Leet in Leet speak. You know, the 1 is the L, the 3s are the E's, and the 7 is the T. Okay, so that was just the intro. Yeah, um, I think it's the only time I ever put my middle initial um, in the intro by saying it. Um, it's in the lower third always, but I, I don't need that on. I think it was the first time that I had actually said my middle initial, the only time I said my middle initial. So I've used a total of seven cameras over the years. Um, the flip cam was what I started, the Flip Mino is what I first started with. Uh, then I had the Kodak ZI8. Uh, three different iPhones have been used. So uh, I've had the iPhone 11 Pro, which is this one. I've used the 10 uh, for some travel stuff. And I think it was the 7 Plus was the first. I Well, actually, I've done four phones. Because I had one episode with, I think, the iPhone 4. My dad held it, and I was doing tacos because the... Um, because the flip cam had died and I didn't have a camera until I bought the Kodak ZI8. So I needed to record an episode. So my dad was sitting about where you're at. Actually, it was a little bit farther over because I was used to sit a little bit farther over on the table. And he was hand holding the phone. God love him. Um, then the Canon Vixia uh, HF M500, um, the DJ, DJI Osmo Pocket. So I've had a lot of stuff. The Vixia really was the game changer. Um, really gave me a dramatic increase in quality over even the Kodak ZI8, even though the ZI8 could shoot 1080p. I think a lot of times I end up being in 720p on that. Um, and then allowed me to do green screen, which is what I got going on here. And that started by the end of 2012. So it was like three and a half years before I even got into the green screen stuff. And that was really when I felt like I was taking the show to another level. Before we go on, let's, 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 let's watch couple of the other clips from episode one. The other goal of this uh, wine show is that we're going to try to do wines that are under $10. There may be the occasional higher priced one, but we're going to try to stick with under $10. Now this wine, I want you to know I don't have the, I don't have the receipts. Hold on. I'll be right back. So I'm going to cut in here. Even from episode one, I had mistakes and I leave them in one take for the whole show. Other than a very, very few interviews, and then this will be one of the only shows, uh, some specials and other stuff that is have or clips, but like straight up reviews, I can't remember any straight up reviews where I cut it up in different clips. Let's keep watching. All right. In the spirit of this is in one take, we don't do retakes. All right, so this wine does not fit the under ten dollar thing. This wine was thirteen ninety nine at World Market. All right, so uh, yeah, I got the everything in one take from Gary Vaynerchuk. All right, and let's watch one more clip and then we'll move on to some other stuff. Let's uh, let's go ahead and taste it. And see how it is. So I don't think I swish as much as I used to, like mouthwash swishing. 
think I just do more like suck in like air. Wine. Very dry. And yeah, like a cookie jar. It's a cookie tin all over my, my mouth. Um, I get some, I get again the dark fruit flavors. Uh, I wouldn't call it a fruit bomb, but um, definitely could not drink this by itself. Or at least I couldn't. Uh, maybe you could. I would definitely want to pair this up with a nice steak, uh, something very heavy. I mean, as a cab, cabs you know tend tend to be heavier wines. You know, it's not it's not a light wine. Uh, also, just so you know, cabs are not necessarily my favorite wines. Uh, I tend to gravitate towards Zinfandels as far as reds and Syrahs, Shiraz or Shiraz. Shiraz in Australia, by the way, that's how they pronounce it. Um, <clears throat> so those are those are the varietals and the reds I tend to gravitate towards as far as the big bodied ones. So talking about my favorites, so it's kind of funny. Back then, I definitely gravitated towards Syrah and Zinfandel. Now I probably get gravitate away from those. Well, Syrah, I still love Syrah. Shiraz, I don't maybe drink as much, but Syrah, especially Northern Rhone Syrah. I had a California Syrah recently. It was spot on. And I don't drink Zin as much, so I need to get back into doing some more Zins. All right, so out of 522 episodes, including this one, the vast majority of them are reviews. So we're going to do some clips of some reviews. Um, they're just spread out over the years. A lot of the, uh, I did a decent amount of earlier ones because I kind of was a little goofier with some of these things. But um, yeah, let's go ahead and watch. Let's go and watch uh, episode 44, which was titled Son of a Beach. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I am your host, Mark Fusco. Welcome to another uh, episode of Leet Wine TV. So, <clears throat> Son of a Beach, that's what we're having today. It's 2005 Son of a Beach Chardonnay from the central coast of uh, California. So, yeah, I, I hated that wine. Um, in the review, I did say that I was going to drink the rest, and I did, but yeah. So, episode 100. So we're going to watch the intro to episode 100. The significance about this was that this was the first episode I actually put intro music into. And it was GarageBand, it's, so it's royalty-free music. And I also put some royalty-free sound effects, or as far as, I knew, as far as I knew at the time, they were royalty-free. Um, and well, we'll just do the intro, and then uh, I'll talk about other stuff. You also see that the scroll now is in the middle rather than the bottom. I kind of think I should put that cork and that cork sound effect and porting sound effect back in and the clinking. I like those. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Leet Wine TV. I am your host, Mark Fusco, here for episode. 100. So you'll notice I am wearing the same shirt I wore in episode one. I'm not doing that today. I also wore that shirt for episode 450 for the 10th anniversary. And I also wore that shirt for episode 200, which was, um, I'm not going to show that clip, not because it was a bad clip. Yeah, I'm not showing that clip. But it was a fun clip where I was, I think my first live audience thing was Ceci and Melissa at, at Ceci's Wine Shop. So let's watch the second clip. And we'll kind of get into the wine here. So we have the Domaine du Pegal Chateauneuf de So the Domaine Chateauneuf, uh, the Domaine du Pegal Chateauneuf de Pop. At the time, I didn't realize this is like one of the top Chateauneuf de Pop wineries. I know now, but yeah. For eighty-three dollars and twenty cents, I decided to go with this because um, one kind of the price. I wanted to get all pricey, but two, there was more on the internet as far as reviews about it that um, um, both wines had great reviews or great, had good reviews. Um, this one just had more reviews, so I felt that I would uh, start with this one. And when I was initially going to buy a wine, I really wanted it to be a hundred bucks, but I couldn't find something that I really wanted to do for a hundred dollars. All right, so um, and Backtracking to the uh, really good wineries things, um, I've already mentioned it before, but this does happen where I go to a winery or I buy a wine and I don't realize how great the wine is because I didn't do 
the research at the time I bought it, but usually now that I'm doing these the research on my wines, when I do review it, I tend to know, oh, this is like a really badass winery. Episode 136. Now this, there's nothing particularly, um, nothing particularly uh, special about this clip as far as like the wine, but um, well, you'll see. Um, it's okay. I don't think it's really... So you see that look in my face? Because I can hear my mom off to my right. And she's trying to talk to me. And I'm like, what the hell? And I'm like trying to like look to the side. And then here it comes. <laughs> That's Pressman, by the way. Um... So God love her. Uh, and she also passed away a few years ago. Um, but God love her. She actually steps, she was going to the laundry room because she left the remote for the TV in there. And she stayed in there for another like five minutes while I was finishing up the review. So let's skip ahead a few more episodes. We're going to go to episode 255. Now, this episode is called Wines and Wasps Do Not Mix. You know, the, you know, these little places, these little coastal towns throughout the United States are going to be pretty much the same. You know, I've been all, off, all up and down the Gulf Coast as a kid, and they all have that same, not same, but they all have a, like a similar uh, quality uh, uh, to it. Uh, uh. <clears throat> yeah, here's the comedy action. Anyway, so um, I'm going to wrap this up because I got the wasp right there, and we're not good with wasps. <laughs> we'll see everyone again next time. So yeah, um, I'm potentially allergic to wasps. Apparently I was stung by a wasp, I don't know, like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was visiting San Antonio, and I don't remember it. Uh, I was given some Benadryl. Apparently my grandmother got stung by, I think, the same wasp, and uh, I was given Benadryl and I went to sleep. I have no memory of this. So I'm definitely afraid of wasps. If you watch any of my other episodes where there's maybe a bee hanging around, like when I went to Patton Valley Vineyards back in October, you might see I get a little nervous, but I, I stay in the seat because bees, you, those types of bees, usually they're, you're fine. Wasps are the aggressive ones. All right, I just put it because the funny, ending was funny. Episode 346. This is a fun one. So this is a review of the Alchemate, which is a portable breathalyzer. And um, it's the first time I intentionally got drunk on camera. So let's take a peek at this one. Let's do a shot. And now we'll do every five minutes. And I'm gonna get me another drink. So the music I use there is like the Florida rag. I really wanted to use the Benny Hill theme, but since that's a copyright, copyrighted song and I don't have the rights to use it, and I don't want copyright strikes on my YouTube channel. Um, yeah. I bet you if I was just just strictly a podcast, I bet you nothing would ever happen because, well, first of all, probably nobody from BBC or Benny Hill ever would have watched this podcast. But, uh, yeah. All right, so we're at the five-minute mark here. And let's see where we're at. I don't feel any different. I don't feel tardy. Wow. 0 0.104. I've almost doubled where I was before. <clears throat> to the um, next level, overexpression, boisterousness, possibility of nausea and vomiting, reflexes as far as um, impairment, reflexes, reaction time, gross motor control, staggering, slurred speech, temp <laughs> temporary erectile dysfunction. I'm not going to test that. I thought I'd go that far because it was kind of a funny little side comment. All right, so... Now we're going to skip pretty far ahead, well, not that far, but we're going to go up to episode 411. And this was, um, this was a fun episode because I had a couple friends on that weren't really wine drinkers. And it was more about, let's just do like, a, let's just do an episode about hanging out at the pool. So my friends uh, Christian and Laurelin uh, joined me and uh, this was right before I had my heart surgery. So this is two years ago. 
something that I've come, I've been come to known as. Yes, somebody who uh, does this. So first of all, let me introduce this uh, this little bottle. This is from the region of Mexico, Cate uh, Cate. I'm sure you guys are familiar. Very good, yeah. solid. Uh, you know, Mexican beer. It wasn't beer. this the beer that originated using a lime? Yeah. And you drink because you had to drink it from a can. Yeah. Yes. That, I don't know if that was a San Antonio thing, but growing up in San Antonio, everybody drank Tecate for the longest time. And then Corona showed up. I'm like, what? Put that glass out what? of here. Get yeah. out of here. Yeah. So this is uh, it requires a little bit of preparation. Yeah, you want to fill the the rim here with some uh, lime juice, All right? Okay. This is a very special lime juice, and you'll see why when you taste it. Oh, okay. Is it spicy? No. So you get the lime juice there. Okay. You put a little salt, preferably some beer salt. Beer you know? salt. Okay. What, what you what you got to do is you got to put it right where the uh, the little the little thing is going to yeah. drop in there. So uh, you'll see why. You just give it a couple little a couple little dabs. Hit actually, with, I hit say, with the dab. Actually, I want to say the last time I did this was World Cup. Wow. Because it was, I had like a weird Sunday off or Saturday off, and we went to the pool, and we were watching World Cup. Is that four and years I, I want to say that, yeah, I want to say that Mexico was playing too. I think I might have been anywhere. Yeah, yeah. they're playing this Saturday. They are. They're gonna win. You, you want you want to go somewhere and watch it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So same thing, you drop a little... What is that? This is a little Michelada sauce. Michelada. So it's, it's a beer thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, ideally, please, go ahead and go to Tabasco. Uh, so yeah, open it, wait about a half second, let the stuff go in there. You go as far as you want. I recommend going at least halfway, so then the lime juice and the salt and everything kind of sits oh, like in there. Oh, like wait. No, no, no. Or like drink halfway. Drink about half. Okay. If you can. If you can go all the whole, the whole way, you get a medal, which is really cool. You ready? Yeah. Right. Ready. There you go. Leet Wine TV. Leet Wine TV. No shaky poo. Ah, there we go. You think I? Do you think I got the whole one? Oh, the carbonation is way too much. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna try, dude. Delicious. I really was gonna try. I really was gonna try. I did it to do the. Oh my whole god! Thing. I think I got about halfway. I think I got about a quarter way. And here's your middle. You just hang it on your neck. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Christian gave me a medal for that. Um, so yeah, uh, Christian and I are really good friends. Uh, Laurelin, I know I know through Christian. Uh, but Christian, I've been friends for a while, and same with Laurelin. But uh, actually, Christian and I should be doing a Skype call and doing some like just kind of a little bit back and forth about some wines. So look for that episode. All right. So. Um,
and look for those coming in another couple of weeks or whatever. So we're just going to show you the intro to uh, lesson one, and uh, that's the only thing we're going to show for Psalm School. But I started this way back in 2009, I think it was like July, June, July, I'll put the lower third, what month the first Psalm School was. So, as you can see, no music. I don't even think I had any music for Psalm School because it was, I, Lesson 29 was before I hit 100. Hey everybody, welcome to Sama Ye School. And I used to say Sama, Sama Ye or something like that. Now I actually pronounce the L, Sama Ye. Here on Leap Wine. Uh, this is Lesson 1, first lesson, so I want to welcome all of you for joining me with this. Um, if you watched episode nine, I kind of went through a big long explanation of what sommelier school is, but we'll try to shorten it up. This is my attempt to uh, not only educate you, but re-educate myself with uh, all the things that you need to know for uh, sommelier, to take the introductory exam to sommelier, or the introductory sommelier exam. Um, as, as a wise person once told me, teaching is learning twice. Okay, so um, as you can now hear, I'm using the actual lavalier, but in part of my experiments, I'm using my video micro, my Rode video micro, which is attached directly to the iPhone. So at least the audio will be a little bit better. However, because it's a shotgun mic and I've got the dishwasher going on in the background, you've probably heard all that noise. I should have eliminated a decent amount of it, but we'll see. That's what you get when you have do it all by yourself and then you forgot to do your checklist. Anyway, so yeah, lesson one and then we just went on from there. So shortly after starting to use a green screen, uh, early 2013, I began to use a separate audio recorder, which um, you've seen me, you've seen it in the past. It's the Zoom H1. And I also now have the H6, which you can kind of see here, which is now recording. And, <clears throat> you know, I really wanted to get up my game because the audio that came from whatever camera I was using sucks and you've heard it in prior episodes. Matter of fact, uh, what was it? Episode 518, I think it was. I never even knew I never started this. So the entire episode's crappy audio. You can clean it up a little bit, but it still doesn't, it still is not good. But you know, when I, when I got the green screen and then I got the separate audio recorder, that's when I felt like I was taking this a lot more seriously. And I mean, I've really tried to improve things over the years. I mean, I've got the green screen. I've got three different lights to illuminate me. I've got, I've got actually the little chandelier here is the same LED temperature lights. So I've got really smooth light coming. I've got, now I use LED lights to um, light the green screen, whereas before they were halogen, so when I would sit back, you would get that like warm feeling, because or that warmer uh, skin tone, which was great because the, the uh, picture I use in the background has like that regular incandescent light above my head. That was actually kind of cool. I kind of maybe should go back to that. But these are much lighter and easier to use, and they don't get hot. Specials. So since so the very first year, I've done I've done some holiday specials. So I did Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve. I've done those every year that I've actually produced, you know, wine review podcasts. And then I've done some other ones like Easter, Valentine's Day. Uh, I don't really do those a lot. I did Easter once, but that was a lot of fun to do that one. Uh, or maybe I've done two of them. I've done one. Valentine's Day I did for a few years, but I kind of got away from that because, I don't know, I just... Being in restaurants, Valentine's Day is such a turnoff for me. But by far, my favorite episode to do is Halloween. So we're going to watch the very first Halloween special. I misspoke when I said that I've been using that Halloween theme since the first Halloween um, special. I didn't. I used something else to intro. You'll probably recognize it. So let's go ahead and watch it from the intro.
okay, so my dad's working the the chandelier light with regular lights, and we have a little dimmer switch over to the side, and it was just too dark. So I told him to crank it up, and then I was like, oh, it's too light. And so I'm trying to get him to adjust the lights. It was a first attempt. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Leaked Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for a special Halloween edition of the show. All right, so now that you've probably stopped laughing, we're going to do three wines. This is the first for 1337 Wine TV. They're all themed for Halloween. So as you can hear, I put little sound effects and all that kind of stuff. I still do that. It gets a little more complicated now. But I pretty much use the same sound effects, a little bubbling cauldron, which I now have like a fake cauldron to use. I have the Horatio skull since episode one, the candles going. Um, I, I've used different parts of the house to do the Halloween episode. I've done like the little dinette part in the, in the kitchen area. I've done it in the living room. Um, I'm back to using this set, but um, it's probably the episode I love doing the most. So let's watch last year's episode. Obviously, that first one, the video quality was really crappy because the camera doesn't do really well in low light. Not that any of the cameras I've used since then have been great in low light, but they've been better. And you know, I tried to improve it. Uh, of course, the green screen has allowed me to put different backgrounds in there. And I've uh, played around with uh, different parts of the house. The lighting, I've changed up, like I've had lighting that really dramatic, dramatic lighting where I have like a side light to like put my face in kind of a shadow. But I like to use this setup because it just gets more even light and you can see the wines. Um, the most one, the most recent one, I, I made it all black and white. So let's go and watch that intro and you'll see the dramatic difference. <laughs> Welcome to Monster Chiller Thriller 10! <laughs> yes, this is the 10th episode, the 10th year of Monster Chiller Thriller, the Halloween special. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your ghoulish host, Mark Fusco. So, yeah. Um, I, I tend to kind of stumble over my intro on the Halloween episode because it's not like a habit thing. And I kind of just do it on the fly. I got some thumbnails here of episodes two through nine. You can kind of see what things have looked like over the years. And uh, yeah, let's check that out. All right, so yeah, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve. Um, you know, I, I focus, I try to focus on the typical wines for those holidays, especially like food pairings. I mean, I do it also sometimes with, with the Halloween episode. I mean, I've done actual candy pairing. The uh, Easter, the Easter one was fun. Uh, I did Easter candy with that. I still think I've done it only the one time, but I'm going to show you some clips because I use different backgrounds throughout the show. And I'll show you some, some, uh, some clips of that, not clips, I'll show you some pictures of that, some stills. All right, and then uh, let's look at some uh, thumbnails from New Year's Eve, Christmas. Uh, try to throw in some Thanksgiving ones. There's a couple times I've done special backgrounds for Thanksgiving. But a lot of times the background for Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve has been the Christmas tree, but we don't put the Christmas tree behind me anymore. It's in a different part of the house. So yeah, and I pretty much just stick with the fourth quarter holidays. Interviews. Now, while the Halloween episode is probably the the episode I enjoy doing the most of 
all episodes. As a category, interviews are probably the thing I love to do more than just the reviews. Trust me, I love getting back to doing reviews if I did a whole bunch of interviews. I take you know, a trip or whatever, and then it's kind of like, God, it feels really good to be back on the set doing reviews. It always is, and I really enjoy doing reviews. But doing these interviews, these in-person interviews, but even the Skype interviews, they're, they're still like, I love doing them. Um, I tend to get some extra perks out of this, especially the in-person one. The Skype ones, I've gotten the free wine. Like we do, we do a wine taste and they send me the wine for free. Yeah, it's great. Um, <clears throat> but before we dive into, before we dive into interviews, let's talk about this wine here. Now I got a little chill on it. So you can't really see, it doesn't really have it on the actual label here. <clears throat> let's turn it around. See if you can see that. So this is from William Chris. It's their Wanderer series. Uh, it says red blend on the front, but um, it's actually marketed as the Cinso because it's 95% Cinso and then it's 5% Mavedra. And it's all from the Texas High Plains. And this particular wine is about 20 bucks. Unfortunately, it's sold out at the winery, but you can find it in retail around Texas. If you're outside of Texas, unfortunately, you're probably not gonna be able to find it. Um, but let's get a little more in there. Anyway, um, so I'm gonna read the back label just because um, it has a full story on it. So our community has made William Chris what it is today. In return, we've collaborated with our friend and master sommelier, Craig Collins, who's also my mentor. Uh, to create this Texas Red Blend, the proceeds will support the incredible group of chefs, servers, psalms, and bartenders in the Texas restaurant community to help them get back to doing what they love. Um, and it does say to serve slightly chilled. And which I did. I had in the fridge for a little bit uh, to get it a little bit colder. And I, I've had it out for the past like 20 minutes or so. But uh, uh, I love William Chris Wines. Um, I did an interview with them several years ago and uh i also went up there last year and i did a little episode about visiting them i'm just going to put this off to the side all right i'm gonna take a there we go got it out so last year i did i did an episode where i did like a kind of a recap thing and they had the vineyards behind me it's one of my rare outside uh, videos. So anyway, um, as I mentioned, episode 267, back in 2013, I interviewed Vineyard. I put master, but Vineyard manager, uh, Matt uh, Jacksick, and seller master, Josh Frisch, uh, episode 267. If I remember correctly, Josh is still with him, but Matt is somewhere else. So I'll have a link below. I'll have a link below to anything I've referenced, whether you've seen the clip or not. Um, I've also met the William, Bill, and the Chris of William Chris uh, a few times. So they're really cool people, and I really like what they're doing with the Texas wine industry. They're, they're definitely proponents of uh, only using Texas grapes. I'm not saying that tons of wineries in Texas are not using 100% Texas grapes, but the reality is outside of the big four, <clears throat> as far as Cali, Oregon, Washington, New York State. The other 46 states, a significant amount of those states buy bulk juice from California because California produces more wine than it needs. And you need, if you need wine, if you need to bulk up your wine production, it's there. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not 100% of your state's juice. Uh, and I do plan to visit them, uh, hopefully when this pandemic stuff is finishing up and that's what this whole thing is about the pandemic you know the restaurants bars and lots of other businesses but since wine is so is so um, ingrained and integrated in the hospitality industry they want to do their part for an industry that that supports them and so i wanted to also do my part and i bought a couple bottles but um, as soon as this pandemic stuff settles down or gets to the point where i feel i can go visit them i plan to do it because i'm going to do some drone footage of the property. So um, let's talk about the wine. Let's, let's check it out. 
I've had a Senso from them. I don't know if this is the same juice or a different blend. I probably should have asked before I started doing the review, but let's check it out. So you've got some really great like tart red fruits and like a kind of a smoky quality. Yeah, just like a like a smoky quality, a roasted quality, um, red fruit, kind of a darker red fruit, but it's also bright. It's a dark, a bright dark red fruit. I know it doesn't sound it doesn't sound like you can do that, but it really smells wonderful. Spice driven, bramble. Smells like the Texas countryside. Oh, wow. So the fruit comes a little more ripe on the palate, a little juicier on the palate versus on the, on the nose. It was like more of a dried out fruit and that bramble and smokiness. And it kind of finishes with this somewhat sweeter or riper fruit style and like a little bit of like whipped cream and like, like say it was like a, a, a red fruit pie has some whipped cream on it. Um, it tastes delicious. And um, yeah, I'm glad I got some. Isn't the label really cool too? Like, this, so that's their, their this is um this is a vine, and that's their um, that's their symbol. So I'm gonna sip on some more of that, and then I'm gonna probably finish this Bruno Payard. And I'm gonna finish this later. All right. So let's get back to the show. So I so buy if you're in Texas and you see this somewhere, you should buy it. Not, not because, not solely because of the good cause it is, but it's good wine. And figure out what the bonus is. Is it the bonus is a good cause? Or is it the bonus is that, oh, it's a good wine too. I'm helping out somebody. Oh, by the way, the bonus is a really good wine. Pick, pick which side you think the bonus is, but yeah. All right, so I jumped on the Skype bandwagon um, really early on doing interviews and I did a few more over the years and then I kind of didn't do a lot of Skype interviews for quite a while but then I've done some recent ones I did like three recently because of the whole pandemic and I would say I'm probably the first video wine podcast uh, maybe even quote internet YouTube show to do video Skype for wine uh, obviously not the first video podcast or the first YouTube channel to ever do video Skype but for the wine side, I might be the first one to do it. And I can tell you the early days of Skype, a lot of hit and misses. I mean, first of all, audio quality was sketchy a lot of times. More for whomever my guest was rather than necessarily um, my side. But I did have an uh, interview with Gary Vaynerchuk that was the video, the audio was just horrible. Um, and I don't know how in the world I pulled it off. It still was a bad audio, but at least was usable. But um, one of my early Skype interviews was with Cindy Costco of Passaggio Wines, and she does really cool stuff. And let's go ahead and take a look at that clip. Cindy, let's, uh, let's talk about you. Who are you? What's your story? Kind of how did you get involved in all this? Everybody has a story, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm originally from West Virginia. Uh, born and raised there. Um, I used to listen to my grandfather talk about uh, making wine. I used to watch him in the basement making wine, and I think that's how I got the passion. So as you can see in here, video quality, not the best. Even the audio quality on my end wasn't really great. I was using a Bluetooth like earpiece, you know, old school cell phone earpiece. And I mean, I've used headsets like she's using. Um, I've used like lavalier mics, all kinds of stuff. And uh, the most recently, like I said, I did three Skype interviews with people. And uh, I've, I've used my phone as the webcam. And um, I've used the lavalier. So the audio and video quality is definitely way better than, than the old Skype interviews. So I did, uh, it was a winery, uh, a distributor who's also one of my friends. 
and then one with a, an ambassador for a winery who's also was in my tasting group a while a long time ago and then um in-person interviews let me tell you it's really hard to choose just a few and i did choose just a few or several so last year i highlighted um two interviews well i had three because i did bruno but i highlighted two other interviews i had done and my first interview at Pedernalis, and then my interview at benziger and i use them because well the people at Pedernalis have been friends of mine ever since then and uh, i love everything they do too and then Benziger I used because the it was the first place I actually got to see biodynamic done. Now, when I went to Fawn Roque, which is Al, Alan Moik's, um, who I've already mentioned before, they practice bio, but I didn't get the full tour of seeing like teas being made and, and, and the um, manure pile and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> At Benziger, I got to see the whole thing and the ecosystem that goes along with it. So... It was amazing. So that's why we really wanted to highlight those wines last year, plus the Bruno Payard. Um, and as much as I want to pick an interview from each major trip, it just went in too many clips. Um, so I, I had to really pare it down. So I, I really just want to emphasize this. Every single interview I've done, whether it's a Skype interview, whether it's an in-person interview, um, there's something special about it for me. You know, I, I've, I've gone and visited people. You know, I did, had Ceci on the show uh, at her wine shop. Actually, Ceci's been at the house. She's the only person that's actually been at the house here. Um, I've done interviews at restaurants. I've done interviews at wine bars and wineries. And I could show clips of almost any of them. But I really had to kind of really um, just try to pick the best examples um if you will and you know the thing is these interviews have besides the experience of just sitting next to somebody and talking about the wines whether they're the winemaker or the marketing person or the tasting room manager or whatever um the fact that they're spending two to three hours of their time with me of their day um Sometimes they've accommodated me last minute and I'll say it's more because there was a miscommunication between us. The, the appointment was made, but somebody either my end or their end didn't get the memo or maybe showed up on a different day or showed up at a different time. But I can say that as far as me, if I've shown up, it's because that's the scheduled date and time that I thought we agreed to. But I did unfortunately skip an appointment in Bordeaux and I was never able to get back to them. They were totally going to be like, Hey, come by any time this week. And it was during harvest by the way. And I just couldn't make it happen. I feel bad because I, I definitely had to go back to Bordeaux and they will be first on the list too. Um, but you know, they've, they've pulled expensive wines. They've pulled old wines, rare wines. Uh, sometimes it's all three in one wine. <laughs> Um, I've gotten free meals. I've had, you know, a phone rock. I had lunch at the winery with everybody from the vineyards. Um, you're going to see the very first interview I'm going to show you. Uh, after the interview, we had lunch at the winery. They, they, they little sandwiches. I mean, it, was, it wasn't like extravagant. It was just like a simple lunch, but they touched me. Um, I've had other wineries offer me free, you know, take me to lunch or do dinners with them at some point. Of course, I've gotten, I've also gotten free wines from the visit or, you know, getting the good friend discount, the industry discount. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of these have been very significant for me. So the first interview I'm going to show you, this is Fall Creek Vineyards. I visited them mid-summer 2011 and Ed and Susan all are, are really pioneers in the Texas wine industry. Uh, they were the first winery I visited and did an interview, and I broke it up to three parts. I used the Kodak ZI8 for this one, and it was a rock star because it just kept recording, and it's one reason why I'm a big fan of using cameras that are meant for video, not using DSLRs or mirrorless, or even just digital cameras because they have a time limit on video, on just like long clips. And... Um, 
uh, we're going to see a small clip, and Susan had just joined us. Um, we, it was just myself and Ed at first, and then Susan joined us a little bit later. And after we finished this, like I said, they made sandwiches. She made paninis. And I'm still blown away by this. And I, I got to see them many, many years later at their other location in Dripping Springs. We were up in their Tau, Texas. It's spelled Tow, T-O-W, but it's pronounced Tau. And so I met them at the actual winery, and Ed gave me a great tour. We talked about all kinds of cool stuff, wine, wine, wine stuff and non-wine stuff. And it was really cool to see them again up in Dripping Springs. Um, and I also had, uh, last year at the Texas Hill Country Winery Symposium, I interviewed their current winemaker, uh, Sergio, Sergio Quadra, and um, so I'll put a link to his interview, and that was episode 434. But let's go ahead and watch uh, the clip here from Fall Creek. How, how the wine industry in Texas has grown uh, pretty quickly over the past 30 years or so. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know... And you'll hear that the audio is pretty rough because I'm using the on-camera mic from the Kodak ZI-8, and it was a, it was a lot of echo in the room. Obviously, since then, I've tried to minimize these problems, but occasionally stuff happens. I remember those early days when John Lester and Fall Creek and La Vida were getting this industry off the ground, and it was it was pretty shoestring because we had legislative changes that had to be made in order to even do this in certain areas of Texas, and we were we were all very small. So to, to realize that we've come to where we're over 200, you know, wineries in the state now, and that many of them are, you know, getting quite large and getting national, international renown, it's, it's been a uh, been a very interesting experience, and there's a lot of excitement ahead, and I think you're going to taste some of that when we get to our next wines down here, because um, when you see what Texas really can do. Um, you know, the sky's the limit. So, as you can see, we had three wines at the time there. And we went through a wide range of wines, from entry level to their to their top wines. And, you know, that's that's the kind of experience I get a lot of times at wineries. Now, I will say that I normally ask them to do, after having wineries do this, where we taste like 10, 15 wines, I have asked them to try to keep it to two or three wines, but occasionally they're just like, no, let's just do a lot of wines because it's I'm on their time. I mean, Don Hoff, we, I can't, I lost count how many wines we did. Erath, we did like 12 or 13 wines. And you know what? I love when we do that. I love when we do it. But, um, you know, I, I don't want them to feel obligated to have them taste me on their entire line of wines. I just say, hey, just give me a couple wines, two, three wines, so, you know, maybe a, a wide range of stuff, and, you know, let's go for it. All right, so the next episode we're going to do is uh, my Bordeaux trip, which was later that year. That was in September, and I've already alluded to it was during harvest. And this is the Doisy of Your Dream, episode 184. So I've already kind of mentioned that I've interviewed a lot of cool people in Bordeaux, and... Uh, you know, the few Texas winery interviews I did earlier that year, including the Allers, it was kind of a prep, kind of a preview of going to Bordeaux. I had already booked my trip to Bordeaux. So I used the Texas trip to kind of get comfortable with doing interviews and kind of figuring out how I want to film them. And I include this clip um, with Olivia Casaja, who is the owner of Doisy for Dream. Um, because he didn't have it in his calendar and, but we had traded emails like I think in May of that year, I was in, I went there in September, May or June, we had confirmed everything. And you know what? He saw that I was being genuine, that I had an email. I couldn't find it. He was like, I can take the time. And he did. And that's why I mentioned like, you know, sometimes they just, they're just like, Hey, let's just accommodate you and let's just get going here. Uh, Alan Moix, uh, Chateau Fon Roque. I've already mentioned it. His was cool because um, if I haven't mentioned it was hard to hear him, I'm going to do it again. So his interview was really cool, but it's really hard to hear him. And there was tons of echo in the room and the distemper was on outside. So I've already mentioned why the audio was messed up with him. But um, 
uh, if you go, the Moik's name sounds familiar, but it's not Alan or Elaine. It's, they pronounce it Alan, but it's spelled A-L-A-I-N. His cousin is Christian Moik's. Now, that name hopefully rings a bell. If not, that's okay. But he's associated with Petrus, which is basically the best winery in Pomerol. And he's also responsible for Dominus, Dominus in Napa Valley. And they're an outstanding winery in Napa Valley. So when I went out there, I didn't realize who Olivier was or his family. I did not realize who Alan and his family were. It just didn't ring a bell. I was still kind of new to things. I didn't really understand the dynamics of all these connecting the dots. But um, yeah, if I had realized that, I might have been able to go to Petrus. But and I, I, at the time, I kind of knew that he was associated with Christian Moikes, but I didn't want to press the issue. Uh, if I went again this time and I visited him, I was like, hey, Alan, do you think you could get me into Petrus? You know, why not? Especially since I've already met him. But, you know, Olivia's family is, they're no slouch. They are major negotiants in Bordeaux. And negotiants is kind of that person that they, the official definition is a wine merchant who assembles uh, the produce of winemakers and smaller growers and then sells the wine under their own name. Uh, Burgundy, famous for negotiants. And um, so the Casaja family in Bordeaux, they're major players in this type of stuff. And I didn't realize that at the time. Like, I'm sitting next to, like, rock stars in the Porto community. Um, so let's watch uh, the Vidrine video. So, um, Olivia, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about you and your family and, and the estate. Okay, let's put it up. Um, so, Les Vidrine is a seven plus five gross okay. um, in Barsac. And uh, this property has been bought by my family around uh, 1840 okay uh, so for this time it belo belongs to the same family um, I am in charge for the the property uh, for uh, 1972 I began to work here with my father at the beginning and then my father passed away in uh, 2001 okay and uh, so from this time I um, look after the property so um he was like so chill. Like he didn't mention that his family were negotiants that I can remember in this interview. I mean, I watched a decent amount of the interview again, and I don't remember seeing any of that. You know, he's just like, yeah, we just own this winery. We bought in 1840. I've been there since 72. And uh, that's what we do. It's like, okay. And I'm like totally oblivious. One of the other cool things about this is that, and I mentioned it in the interview, is that we're walking around, we get into the house and in the room that we did this in, uh, there's, there's a uh, the 101 top wines from Gary Vaynerchuk at the time, and his wine's in it. And that's kind of how I found out about him. Plus, I have a really good friend whose uh, last name is Vadrine, spelt differently, but apparently her branch of the family actually owned it and then sold it to these guys. So that's a cool little uh, backstory on that. So I mentioned rock stars. So we're going to skip ahead a few years and... We're going to show a video from my Napa Sonoma trip, but not in Napa and Sonoma. This is back 2014. So my dad and I drove out to Napa and back. So on the way back through Arizona, we decided to make a side trip to Jerome, Arizona and visit a place called uh, Caduceus Cellars. And um, so I interviewed probably the most interesting person I've ever interviewed him, probably one of the most interesting people I've ever met. And he's still probably the most interesting person I've ever interviewed. Now, it doesn't necessarily come across that way in the interview, but he is, he's like the epitome of cool and interesting. And it's not Maynard James Keenan at all. All right. He is the owner of the winery and the winemaker, uh, Maynard is. And I had like that small snowball chance in hell of actually interviewing him because I was there at a time he might have been around, uh, because he's usually there during harvest and at that time of year, and then he tours in the winter. But um, yeah, his name is Brian Sullivan. He's the GM of the cafe and tasting room. He's also kind of the town historian. He kind of goes through this in the interview. 
and um uh yeah let's just let's just watch the clip because he's he's just cool I could care less who the winemaker is. I mean, yeah, it's kind of cool. You know, that's cool. You know, Maynard's the winemaker. Okay, you got a musician making it, very well-known musician. But, you know, I think I wanted the wine was good. If I didn't think the wine was good because I had already tried it, I wouldn't have made a trip two hours out of Phoenix to come here. Okay? <laughs> well, well uh, one of the comments I recently read on our Facebook page, uh, somebody commented, Maynard who? She said, the wine is the real story here. I don't so uh, I love the fact that Brian put in there that there are people that are like, they don't, like I was, I, not that it, hey, I know who Maynard is. He does really, his tool does really great stuff. Pussifer and I think Perfect Circle. I, I may be wrong in that one, but he has a lot of different band projects going on. They do amazing music, but I'm not a fanboy. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the music in the sense that I appreciate it, but you know, my mindset is when I'm going there, I'm going there because of the wine. If it happens to be a famous person, cool. But I'm not going to go to a winery just because some famous person is associated with the wine, whether they actually make the wine or not. If they make the wine and it's good wine, that's kind of a bonus. Like Maynard makes the wine. If I remember correctly, Pink is actually the winemaker for her wine. And I don't remember if I think Britney Spears makes a wine. Same idea, like she's apparently the winemaker. But you have a few people that actually are the winemaker and they're celebrities. So, and Maynard, probably the first one really to do that because he's been the winemaker uh, since like the late 90s. But um, yeah, I just want to interject on that is that that's why I went there because the wine's good. And yeah, there was a possibility of interviewing Maynard. It would have been really cool, but let me tell you, Brian was also cool. Yeah. Care who made it? Just <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, the wine is good, and it's it's something that nobody in our industry, as far as the media side of the industry, really talks about. Yeah, there's people in the know. I mean, I'm sure if I you know if I would went to somebody in Wine Spectator, they would probably know. Yeah, they make wine in Arizona, but it's just it's something that's I seek out the new, the different, and the inter interesting. Um, that should be probably my tagline instead of your elite wine resource, right? But um, but it, it's. That's what I look for. I look for stuff that's new, especially new to me. Mm -hmm. Things that are interesting. This is interesting. Jerome is it? I never knew about this. Jerome, Jerome, Jerome is, is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you are fascinating. Oh, thank you. Okay, this is, you are perfect for this. Okay, um, you're a fascinating person. Um, the wine is fascinating. The story is fascinating. Yeah, Maine is fascinating. Okay, yeah, but the, the fact that we're making excellent wine here in the desert is why I really wanted to make that that effort to come so up. So obviously here. the clip is more me than him. So I really encourage you to watch the interview because Brian goes through the, the history of the town, his history, um, and how he met up with Maynard and all the stuff, the wines we drank. But I use this part of the clip, part of the episode, because I really wanted to emphasize why I visited the winery and how good the wines are. So this wine is really good. I've been sipping on it. So you guys, at William Chris, you're doing excellent stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna do one more clip, one more interview clip. You know, it's really hard to pick these interviews, like I've already mentioned. You know, I've interviewed a ton of people. Um, you know, master psalms, winemakers, other psalms, bar owners, restaurant owners. Um, Dave Mulligan, who's a bar owner up in Dublin, like Ireland. He's probably like the second most interesting guy I've ever interviewed. You should watch that interview. It's episode 507. He basically resurrected an illegal Irish spirit. Um, so yeah, so we're going to do one more. And this is um, last year in Germany. Um, I visited Dr. Lawson and I got to interview Ernst or Ernie Lawson. It's Lawson, not Lawson. And um, you know, I drove directly from the airport in Dusseldorf to the winery and in the Mosul, and uh, his nephew Daniel is who I met, and then we went to some vineyards, and then we went back to the winery, and Ernie still hadn't shown up yet because he was taking a flight from England, and his flight was delayed. And uh, luckily, after all the, like, you know, uh, Daniel, like, give me the tour of the vineyards. There was no winery to tour because the house we're at is more like a tasting area. They actually make the wines elsewhere in the Mosul. But um, 
Ernie shows up about seven or eight minutes into the interview. So we hadn't gone too far into it, but he's an also character, interesting guy. And, um, you know, he, he pulls no punches. Um, when he talks about winemaking and his view on wine, the wine bit, you know, the wine industry in general, and he's just honest, which is great. So luckily this clip is not overexposed. I did the cardinal, I did the cardinal sin of sitting in front of a window um, without having sufficient light. And uh, it was a cloudy day that day. And uh, the sun finally showed up when we sit down for the interview. But luckily this clip, uh, everything is pretty much, pretty much okay on the exposure. We tasted a wide range of wines, but the star of the show, which was the last wine, was their uh, Prelat Baron Auschlesa. And uh, let's, just, let's just watch it because the story is so cool. This is now the Erna Prelat, which is our most finest vineyard. You, you have been there? You know? Yeah, we saw it there. We it saw is a that. small vineyard. It's only four <laughs> acres, you know, um, the whole vineyard. And um, so we are the largest owner there with one and a half acre, more than one and a half acre. Um, and uh, and I told you about the three microclimate factors. Mm -hmm. the, the, the prelate has the perfect micro, three microclimate factors. It's 100% south facing, it's 100% steep, and it's only on the river embankment, very low elevation. Right. But the prelate is the only one which has a fourth microclimate, you know? And that is, when you saw, it's completely surrounded by these massive cliffs, you know, these amazingly massive cliffs, you know, I don't know, I, um, you know, um, and that probably protect the vineyard, you know, like an amphitheater, you know. Right, yeah. And this gives the wine, I mean, it protects it from cold winds and so, you know, protects the whole vineyard. So that makes the vineyard, there you go. Oh, yeah, here you go. You see, it's like a microclimate, you know, like an, like an, Amphitheater, you know, mm -hmm. and so and that protects the whole vineyard from and it's hundred percent south facing, close to the river, you know, very low elevation, you know, hundred percent steepness, and then these huge, massive cliffs, you know, which surrounds the, the prelate, gives it um, a fourth microclimate, and that is basically the warmest vineyard, first bud break every year, first you know flowering every year, first variation mm -hmm. you know, every year, you know, and so yeah, and the and the story in this vineyard, you know was um, the bishop, you know, the prince bishop and uh, archbishop of, of Trier, you know, he, um, he traveled uh, on the Mosul to the residence, to his residence, to Trier, uh, that was 1066, 1066 was another famous number, William the Conqueror, okay. had been going to England, 1066, no? the, um, um, uh, and he had been traveling on the Mosul, and there was a big castle on top of these cliffs I showed you, you know, a huge robbery yeah. knight castle, you know, from the robbery knights, you know. And they thought, oh, it might be a clever idea, you know, to kidnap this old bishop. He was the most powerful bishop in these days and the richest too, you know. Let's kidnap the bishop, you know, and ask for a big fat ransom, you know. So they kidnapped him, put him up to the, <laughs> to the castle. Mm -hmm. But it seems that the bishop didn't have too many friends in the residence because the <laughs> ransom was never paid, you know, never showed up, you know, and they had been feeding this guy for one year or more, you know. <laughs> uh, nowadays you would say a bad investment, you know. Right. Um, and so, and then the people had been so upset about it, you know, that they never get the ransom, you know, that they tear him up to the highest tower and throw him down there, you know. And that is where he ended up, you know. And the legend even says that they tear him up a second time and throw him down a second time, you know, uh, <laughs> because they had been. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, it was a hardcore story and they they were so mad they threw him off twice. They killed him dead twice. And, you know, the wine was awesome. And it wasn't something they had planned to pull, but I was like, hey, tell me the story about the prolat, the the prelate or the prelate and Ernie in German tells Daniel basically, Hey, pull the wine. And it was like the current release. It wasn't like an old, old version, but still delicious wine and rare wine. Definitely not cheap. So, um, I, I need to mention that, you know, I, I've already, I think I've talked about this ton, a, a bunch already that I've interviewed a ton of people and, they're interesting and everything's been really like special for me. 
But I wanted to mention a few ones that I'm not going to use the clips just because the show's going to get way too long if I use all the clips. But let's let's kind of go through some honorable mentions, if you want to call it that. So Christian Palmas of Palmas Vineyards. Um, he's not the winemaker, but he's the guy that's responsible for all the technology. He's like, he's the technology whiz, and that winery is the most technologically advanced winery probably on the planet. It was a one and a half hour interview. Uh, he provided me with some really cool graphics, and I had some really cool pictures of the dome, which is they project their fermentation information on. And we had several wines. There was a food pairing with each, which is basically the experience you get when you go to the winery. And um, uh, and that that's what they do in 2014. I don't know if they changed the food now, but and one of the cool things about him is I'm setting things up. He goes, "Yeah, I, I know who you are. I, I've watched your stuff." Before I, before I got there. And it wasn't because he looked me up. He had knew who I was when I contacted them. And he made us another comment because I had like, we, since we drove, I had like my whole setup except for the green screen. And so I have all these lights and these tripods. He's like, wow, you're way more like professional. I don't remember what term he used, but you got way more stuff than CNN, I think, or M- N- MSNBC or somebody had interviewed him, I think like a few days prior. And they're just like the regular, I mean, granted, their camera's like huge. I have like my Vixia at the time. But yeah, uh, Dr. Bob Young of Bending Branch in Comfort, Texas. So another Texas pioneer and at least in the, let's say the later generation, because you have the Allers are like some of the OGs. Uh, his work with Tanat here in Texas is um, legendary, honestly. And then he uses this... Uh, a process called flash detente and it's also very notable because he's the only one in texas that owns this machine he actually owns it one of the only very few people in the united states that use it and he doesn't hide the fact that he does it to give himself more concentration he can also help do some adjustments with the wine and i appreciate that he's being very transparent on it and you know what the wines are really good my west texas trip last year kim mcpherson jason Santani, uh the winemaker at yano Sicado, vj reddy uh uh, grape grower out there in Brownfield, and then of course Neil Newsom, and another grape grower out there. These are these are all badasses, you know. Kim, VJ, Neil, uh, they're part of the OGs um, as far as like old school. Jason doing awesome stuff at Yano Estacado, also one of the most transparent winemakers I ever met, um, especially like on the interview. And I'm not saying that other winemakers are hiding stuff. And sometimes we talk about stuff off camera and it's not something I really want to bring up on camera. Again, not to be, we're not being deceptive, nothing shady. It's just, it's not relevant to what I want to do on camera. But I mean, he told it like it is in order to make wines that are like 10 bucks. You know, hey, this is what I have to do. And to make good tasting wine, this is what we do. So, you know, Neil and also Simon, uh, awesome interview, but Neil and Simon joined us, I think, almost every day. But every morning, Neil came over for breakfast to the B&B, which was his B&B, which I got to stay at for free. So not only did I have breakfast pretty much every day with Neil, and I think Simon was there every day too. Uh, I had dinner with Neil and Janice, his wife. Um, Went over to his house almost every night and sat out on their deck with Simon most of the nights watching looking at the stars, looking at satellites going over, um, being reminded that I don't know astronomy anymore and, and uh, uh, drinking awesome wine. And uh, it was just one of the most special experiences I've had. And, uh, you know, so you need to check out that interview. Uh, Ted Edwards, an OG from Napa. I mean, as far as like this kind of current set of gener- you know, generation, you make the wine at Napa, at Freemark Abbey, um, at that point, I think for 30 years, and it's when I was out there in 2014, you should watch that one. And Donhoff and Sophia Tanish from my Germany trip. So we watched Ernie, and Ernie was the first interview. That was day one. Then day two, I went out to Donhoff, and amazing interview with Ann Donhoff. We did a ton of wines, and then we had lunch, and then I was a little late to go meet with Sophia Tanish back in the Mosul, and... They called her to let her know what was going on. I was about an hour late. And thank you so much, Sophia, for accommodating me. 
And uh, so being an hour late and we kind of had a little, not a rushed interview, but there was no like tour and we were going to go to the vineyard, the doctor vineyard, but the weather was really crappy. So it worked out in that sense. But so she was such a sweetheart and a really great interview. So I didn't want to mention that uh, my Burgundy trip out in 2017, day one, I drove to Alsace three hours each way to meet with Julian Trimbach. Uh, he's the son of John Trimbach. You may know these guys from the Psalm in the Bottle movie or Into the Bottle. And so Julian is the 13th generation of the family. And he's like in his early 20s. And he, of course, he grew up at the winery. But like he, you would think that he'd been making wine or been, obviously he's been there for like 20 something years. But I mean, when you look at how young he is and all the information he's got, it's like he's been paying attention the whole time. He wasn't just some kid who grew up in a winery and then decided at 18, hey, I'm going to help you at the winery. Like he's so integrated in that winery. <clears throat> and Trimbach is arguably top three, two, one, top five in Alsace. Cecile uh, Blanchardon. Um, she, I, I, I have her in my notes as the ultimate pinch hitter from Bouchard Perifis. And I was supposed to interview somebody else, but they were sick. So Cecile was the backup. And the initial, inter, the initial email said that it could be Cecile or maybe one of the other people. But um, the other person was sick. So they couldn't come in. So Cecile took me on the tour, put me, brought me into the inner sanctum. Originally, we weren't going to go there, but she was like, hold on, let me go get the key. And that's where the their oldest and rarest wines are. I didn't, We didn't get to taste them, but I got to see them, which is, that's so cool. And um, Gary Horner, the winemaker at Erath. Uh, Erath is one of the core four wineries of Oregon, Willam of Willamette Valley. And while well, Gary wasn't the original winemaker, he's been the winemaker since like 2003, I think it is. And he pulled out a ton of wines for us to taste. Super interesting interview. And uh, yeah, I've now met people from three of the four core four. I have not met anybody from Irie, but I've met actual David Adelsheim, who's one of the actual OGs. Um, I've met uh, some of the Ponzi family, but I haven't, I never, I did not meet like Dick Ponzi. Um, Dick Erath is the founder of Erath, and then I've never met him. And David Lett of Irie. So I've met three people from three of the four, uh, but I've only met one of the actual OGs, the actual like one of the four guys that started everything. Master Psalms, James Tidwell did a Skype interview, but James is like the co founder of Tech Psalms. So I mean, he and I know each other fairly well. Craig Collins, I've already mentioned. He is my mentor. He lives in Austin, Master Psalm. Did an interview with him at Tech Psalm. And, uh, you know, they've been, def they along with other Texas Master Psalms have been inspirations for me. The legend, legendary Kevin Zraeli, the wine director, uh, Windows on the World, or the former wine director he, that was in the top of the World Trade Center. Uh, he's also an owner of a wine school with the same name. And, uh, you know, obviously since I interviewed him, recent so you know a several years ago he wasn't at the towers when they came down uh but we went through some awesome uh, brunellos that day in houston joe uh Bona country and jeremy parson uh joe owns luce restaurant it's a restaurant that my dad and i will go to uh fairly frequently um so and we consider him family and friend and same he considers that with us uh jeremy also a friend of mine uh has a blog called Do Bianchi, and I met him through Texom. And Joe, I mean, he's been so hospitable to us over the years. Um, we've gone over there for holiday dinners. We've sat at the family table. Um, so he gave us extra food one year during Thanksgiving, like stuff we didn't even order. He was like, here, have it. Like, he's just been awesome. Jeremy, I already mentioned Do Bianchi. He's his wine blog. He's an awesome guy. He's just consulting. He's an educator. Um, good musician. And hopefully one day he and I will get the jam. I uh, already mentioned David and Julie Kulkin, uh, Peter and Alice, their brother and sister uh, owners. And uh, they, they're really great friends of mine. And, you know, I, I can keep going on. You know, I've done like, I don't know, like 50, 60, 70 interviews or whatever. 
and every single one of them have been special. Conferences. So I've gone to a few conferences. Obviously, TechSom, I've done every year, almost every year. Uh, the San Antonio, Co San Antonio Cocktail Conference, I've been there like five years in a row. Um, and then last year, I went to Provine for the first time, and I went to the Texas Hill Country Winery Symposium last year. Also went this year. Most of the conferences, I don't really have like great video content of them, but like this last couple years, I've actually had some pretty good video content from conferences. Um, Texom, I don't really ever do anything with them. Uh, first, because when I first got there, they're like, no video on property. Okay. And then the past several years, I've been a volunteer. And while I take pictures, maybe shoot like funny videos, it's never been for the show because that's not what I'm there for. I'm there to volunteer and make sure the place helps. I, I, I'm not there to make sure. I'm there to help them execute the conference. So I don't want to like be distracted by that. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a clip from uh, Provine and it's going to be my intro, my intro to day one. And then just, you'll see a uh, kind of a, uh, not a time lapse, sort of sped up version of what the conference looks like. So let's go ahead and watch the, um, intro to day one. And, uh, I'm using this really because it got, allowed me to use a piece of equipment that automatically tracks you, my DJI Osmo Pocket, and I really wanted to highlight that. The intro actually shows episode one and episode 400, and then it goes every 10th episode from 10, episode 10 to episode 390. I thought it'd be kind of cool to show that intro because you can get kind of a sense of how the show has progressed over the years. And uh, yeah, let's watch the, the clip. Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco and well, I'm here at this cool place. It's in Dusseldorf. First time ever. Welcome to Provine. This is my first time here at this, at this trade show, the trade fair as they call it. Uh, pretty overwhelmed. I'm in hall 17 right now for day one. This is day one coverage um, and this place is massive. So I was a little dramatic, but um, yeah. And as you can see, there's guys already setting up. I kind of like snuck into that little backdrop because I got there like super early. But you can tell there's other press people there and with like regular video cameras and they got gaffer tape going on. They're like being all professional. I got my like, I got my like really thin portable tripod with a with the Osmo Pocket. You know, I'm definitely you know not at their level, but uh, but yeah. Um, and so we're gonna also watch another clip. And this is going to be sped up two times and it's using the Osmo pocket. And so you can kind of see, uh, what the, one of the halls look like. Uh, and this is also from day one and there's no audio with this. Otherwise it's going to be like chipmunk sound. So, yeah, I'm talking about what, what I was doing at that point. And then, um, I'm like, well, let's show the rest of the hall. And what's cool about the Osmo pocket is you can like, you can like triple click the button and it will, turn and it doesn't stop recording which I, I think is a great option and this is in Italy and I was making comments like the Italian hall is just like gorgeous I'm not saying that the other halls didn't look good but the Italian hall I think was the best looking hall of all the halls. And I was like talking about like, leave it to the Italians to have like the badass, the, the most badass looking um, setup. All right. Yeah. So not much there. I mean, as far as audio. And then we're going to finish the show off with some, a couple of random clips. So last year I had a drone footage and it was his last fall. I went to Oregon with a Willamette. And 
I shot drone footage at almost all the wineries. I didn't do it at Erath, but I did it at all the other wineries. And the clip I'm going to use is at so-called Blosser, which I actually had to go back over the weekend to get the drone footage because the day I went, the weather was not good enough to fly. And the other wineries, the, um, the weather wasn't really that great on a lot of the other wineries. At Patton Valley Vineyards, the weather was really good. But um, I wanted to use the so-called blossom because I think the footage look, was probably the best looking of the footage. Um, Nicholas Shea, the, the, the weather was pretty good that day too. But that's, you see me going up the hill in the intro for them. So uh, it's about two minutes. And this is just the raw footage from the drone. I didn't do any, well, I did a little bit of color correcting on it. But this is just the raw footage of the drone. So you'll see I'll stop and start and things like that. So I'm coming from the back end of the winery and I'm kind of going towards the main the main road. And so they've got two major areas of, of vineyards here. And this is normal speed. I didn't slow it down and speed it up. I really worked hard to have like really smooth flying when I do the drone. When I know I'm going to use like that footage, obviously when I make some turns and things like that, I, I'll like do quick turns. But um it was just like almost perfectly clear day that day. Calm winds. The sky was the sky was not a cloud in the sky. Like in the background, you see mountains. That's not clouds. When I was there, I took some footage from the front. I took off from the front, and the uh, the winery cats they were checking out the drone. They were like, "What's this?" I had to kind of shoo them away because I didn't want like them to like mess with the drone. I remember telling Allison about it. And that's all their property all the way to the road. And I just turned around. So not like smooth, but now that I'm going away from the sun, just look at that. Look at the sky. I mean, the, the blue, yes, it's been color corrected a little bit, but those are their uh, solar panels in the bottom. Um, so that helps power uh, some of the winery there. And now you get to see the back end vineyards. This is probably the best like just continuous drone footage clip that I had where you can really see everything in a really decent amount of time. Whereas some of the other wineries I took like a little, I mean, it was the drone was up the whole time but I only had like a little bit of footage here and there. So that's it for that. For that. Okay, so if you watched the 10th anniversary episode, you may remember I had the champagne saber, sabering story. Um, I'm going to show you that story again. But I'm going to show you first the raw footage of the sabering. This is it'll be in normal speed, where you'll get the actual background noise. And then I also slowed it down so you can kind of see it. It's really not that dramatic, but if you watch the intro, that's what the explosion is, is me savoring the champagne bottle, which is this champagne right here. So that's the Bank of San Antonio. That becomes significant in the story during the episode. Yes. All right, so you may have heard me say yes at the very end there. That's because the first the first bottle I used on this shattered in my hand. So I only had one more bottle to use and it worked perfectly. We thought we had the footage of the shattering, but we didn't. So I was really disappointed I didn't have that as a blooper reel. So here is the sabering at 50% speed and then after that it'll be 25% speed. All right, so here's the clip of me telling the story of doing this champagne savoring. Pay special attention to crowd reaction when I talk about the actual saber and show that to them. <laughs> He's a fucking badass, all right? Um, and this is right after the 
interview. I sh this is right after I showed them the interview with Bruno Payar, so that's why they're clapping. Um, so, uh, okay, first of all, do you like the wine? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I, 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 I crushed it, but then again, it was 19 minutes of, like, you know, drinking. Um, does anyone want to talk about the wine? When he said that bubbles, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Right, right. Either way, I don't care. When he said that bubbles, do you have any of this at your house? No. Oh. I will. Say, you're welcome yeah. to serve this. Yeah. Well, eventually I will. I'm sure I'll have some. They'll, they'll send me some in the fall. Usually, Jane, you better send me some. <laughs> Kate, Jane, you better send me some Bruno Pyard now because Terry wants some Bruno Pyard in the house. So, um, um, so, uh, you so that's my friend Terry, and I really want to put this part of the clip in because she was so disappointed. When I told her, no, I didn't have any of the Bruno Payard at home because she really liked it. Um, and unfortunately, we have not shared any Bruno Payard since then. But so, Terry, if you watch this, we'll, we'll, we'll remedy that. I mean, I'll just get another bottle. Um, but yeah, so let's watch the rest of the clip. Real quick, because uh, you saw the, the savoring, right? Has anyone actually seen an actual real wine saber? Okay, so you can't cut yourself with it, okay? You can stab yourself. You just can't cut yourself. It's blunt. It's no, there's no edge. So quick story. So Christian, who's sitting next to Terry, uh, to her left, he, he had the best reaction. And a lot of people thought I was going to cut myself with the saber. And I did, I did do that on purpose because I knew that a lot of people have never seen a champagne saber or a wine saber. And um, yeah. He had a great reaction, and afterwards he was he was like, he came up to me after the whole thing and was like, "Dude, like you had me on that one." So, all right, here's the actual story of doing the savoring. This was actually kind of funny. So you saw that you know I we we did that and I put the little like you know like explosion and all this stuff. Um, so that took what about an hour total. We 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 filmed some stuff. And then we took a break because it was actually raining. And then I wanted to look at what was happening. I wanted to look at the footage. And Dad was cameraman. Um, and then I was like, well, let's reshoot the stuff. And so we reshot it. And we were done. And it was, it was me and Dad and Scott. And um, so, so again, thank you, Scott, for letting us use, use, this, use the area and use here. Um, it was just like a regular day off for me. It wasn't even after like tasting group. And um, so we're done, and I'm pu we're putting stuff away. And um, the security officer walks in. He goes, yeah, you see, there's some guy, like, walking around, all black, walking around with a sword. <laughs> like, that's me. Like, I literally kind of said it just like that. He kind of looked at me like, yeah, I'm savoring champagne. I don't know what I said. Um, he kind of looked at me like, well, okay. And that was about it, and he left, right? Yeah, and, then he, and then two more dudes, the suits, <laughs> the suits show up. And they basically say the same thing. I'm like, yeah, it's me. And they just, they, 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 they looked at me and they're like, well, you almost had 911 calls on you. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I don't know, you, you couldn't tell unless you were watching, or paying attention. But so I was outside that front door th coming from that direction. And in that corner is the Bank of San Antonio. So can you imagine a guy walking around with a big knife, I know this is Texas, and since 2017, it is perfectly legal for me to walk around in public with this. Just so you know, open carry of large uh, knives in clubs. Did you know that too? You can have a club too. Uh, anything longer than five and a half inches as of, I think, on like September of 2017. I looked it up. Um, but you're standing in front of a bank, dressed all black, big knife. And, and, and you're standing here at this corner, and you kind of stand, and you kind of walk, and you kind of turn. Oh, I mean, go back, because there's somebody in the shot. They don't know that. They keep doing that, and they, you know, yeah. So, yeah, I almost got 911 called on me. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was kind of funny. So, for real, um, I thought about going into the bank and apologizing, but I didn't, and now it's way too late, but... Uh, funny story though, I actually did go into the bank to do some transactions and I thought about mentioning it, but I was like, it's, it was so long ago at that point, nobody there probably would remember. Anyway, so that's it for the clips. So let's just kind of wrap this up. You know, it's, it's really impossible to compress 11 years 
into this time frame. I have no idea what this episode is going to be finished at. We're at two hours and four minutes of me actually recording. And very likely this is an hour and a half episode. Um, but yeah, so just as I cover a wide range of show types and I have all these different types of clips and I just have so many, if it was just reviews, it'd be a lot easier just to pick like reviews that had like some funny like stories and backstories, which is what I did do. But I knew I needed to like kind of, um, leave room for other things. And, you know, it's all the extras that I've been able to do that make these 11 years like that much more special. Um, and those of you that have watched the episodes, I don't care if you've only watched a few, if you've watched a ton of them, if you've somehow watched all 522, wow, I, I, I don't think anyone's actually watched all of them. But, you know, if you're a friend of mine that's just been supportive and maybe you don't watch the shows, but you're watching this one, you only, you only watch like a few special ones, thank you. It's been an amazing run. Thank you to all the wineries that have accommodated me, whether I've interviewed them or I just did a regular visit, you know, just an industry visit. Anyone I've interviewed, no matter if they're a winery, restaurant, bar, Skype interviews, to the people that send me free samples, um, to the people at the wine shops that have helped me, to Underground Cellar and Psalm Select where I buy a ton of wines from. Um, you know, everybody that's somehow associated with what I've done, a huge thank you, because without you, I couldn't do this. And, uh, you know, I've, I've worked really hard on this. I've done what I can to improve things. I'm really pissed off that I completely hosed the first like half hour of the show, but at least that microphone that's attached to the phone should be halfway decent audio versus just the phone. Um, cause I know it was recording it that way, but you know, I've, I've worked really hard to get the show to where it is. And, uh, I should have asked people to do it at the beginning, but if you or watch this on YouTube or on iTunes, please subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Let your friends know if they're into wine that uh, this is the coolest internet wine show podcast that's video out there, in my opinion, and I'm being totally egotistical about this. Um, I'm usually really humble and like really like, no, nah, I do, yeah, no. Right now, maybe it's because I've had a little bit of wine, but I know I do good work. And I really would appreciate uh, some more subscribers. They'd be awesome. Like, spread the word. And uh, I'll have links below to every show that's mentioned. Every, you know, whatever show I've mentioned, there'll be links to those shows uh, for the website. Feel free to watch them. If you're on YouTube, you know, I have playlists that are for interviews, reviews, specials, that type of stuff. So, you can go into the playlist and search that or just search on YouTube. If you go to my channel, you know, the channel page and there's a search bar, you can type in the search. Um, you can type in the search term like Bruno Payard or uh, William Chris or Erath. Um, so because I have, whether it's the title or tags, you should be able to find anything on my own channel. Everybody's channel has this. Uh, free Feel free to hit me up on the socials, uh, though right now I'm in study mode. As you can see, I've got the study beard going on. This thing should be epic next year, depending on what month I take the actual advanced sommelier exam. Um, if you want to support the show, besides just watching it and telling your friends to watch it, there's a PayPal link in the description below, whether it's the podcast or YouTube or the website. You can send uh, some ducats my way. Uh, there's links to equipment that I use for the show. Those are affiliate links for the Amazon. If you buy that, I might get like five cents or something like that. There's some type of commission. Um, so yeah, you can totally support me or just, you know, what, just watch the show and tell people about it. That's the best way to support me. Subscribe to it. However you want to subscribe to it. Get your friends to talk about it. I don't need this on anymore. And um, yeah, we'll see everyone again next time either with a wine review or a Skype review. Cheers.